Hi, this is Alex. This is also Lucas from Envisions, and you are listening to Thomas Garble, the podcast for Power Metal Bod DE. The following episode is in English only. The following episode is not of English. Hello and welcome to another episode of Pommes Gabel, the podcast of Power Metal DE. My name is Pia and today I have two guests uh, from the metalcore band Envisions. I'm here with the guitarist and songwriter Lucas and with the second guitar player Alex. Um, Envisions are going to release a new album called Deadlock on February 12th. And yeah, we're We're going to talk about this album and about yeah, some other stuff as well in this episode now. So enjoy. First of all, Happy New Year, if we can still say that in the middle of January. How has 2021 been for you personally and also as a band? Well, pretty good, I'd say so far. I mean, uh, it's, a, it's always nice to start a year off with some new music and releasing a new album. It's not really, uh, you can't really ask for much more, but I think... Uh, Yeah, so it's been a bit of an interesting ride for us the last like year. So kind of coming into the new year with a new album already, you know, ready to go and in like midway into the actual release campaign is super, super exciting. Yeah, I think the, the, the end of last year was, well, most of last year was quite slow. Um, a lot of it was, uh, was just writing, um, being in the studio. Uh, but then towards the end of the year, we finally got back out on tour, which is our first tour in two years. Um, started releasing singles and then here we are at the start of 2022 and uh, ready to release Deadlock. Have there been any highlights for you, favorite albums or um, of course I'm also thrilled to know how your shows in December have been like because here in Germany we don't really have live shows at the moment anymore. <laughs> yeah, I, I like it's crazy to, uh, it's weird obviously there's no shows for so long and then all of a sudden shows are back and I think instantly we've fallen quite back into the routine of like just expecting them like not You know, it feels weird to imagine what it's like to not have shows again. Everything in the UK seems to be fairly back to normal. Just everyone has COVID all the time now. <laughs> That's the kind of uh, the way it is. But like the shows was awesome. It was so, so good. I think we were pretty nervous. I think like, you know, we obviously haven't played shows for two years and we were coming back into playing shows as a, like a headline tour, playing a load of new songs as well, a load of new gear. And uh, it was, yeah, it was quite daunting. But I think it took that stride pretty quickly which was super exciting and it's just really good energy for us to get right back to it yeah i think we've uh, we've also we've also grown up a lot as people in the in the two years out that we've had so when we got back out on the road it was very much this is your job and and, and you do it um and i think that made the tour a hell of a lot easier i mean when, when we used to go on tour we used to uh, we used to drink a hell of a lot barely did any of that this time we went to the gym every day um, it, it was just uh, much more grown up. Wow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think uh, it's one of those things as well with touring. If you want to take it seriously, if you like, you know, we're having music take away for us for so long. We're like now more hungry than ever to this to be like, you know, our full time jobs. So, like when it all kicked off again, we're like, all right, we need to make this sustainable. So, you know, trying to find those little, little bits of routine that you can get whilst doing like a tour, like going to the gym, it's like a little bit of normality. So you're still kind of connected to the rest of the world instead of being in this like tour bubble, which is uh, <laughs> quite a strange thing. But uh, yeah, no, it was, it was really, really good. Just really, really excited to play some more shows. To be honest, I really want to come back to Germany and play some shows in Germany, but yeah. you know, who knows when that's going to happen at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe in March, but I don't think so. Maybe in May. That's what I think is realistic. Yeah. <laughs> it's probably going to be summer, isn't it? Like, I think that's uh, I think that's where everyone's like tentatively kind of looking at the moment. But you also, you also mentioned uh, albums, like what albums we'd uh, listen to. I'm, I'm only picking up on that because I want to shout about that Era album that came out last mm, year because yeah. that was so so good. I'd like <laughs> Josh, um, our drummer. He was really really into Era. He has been for years, and he was always saying like, "Oh, you know, you gotta listen to them." And I always did like you know dipped in, and I was like, "Okay, cool." But it was one until that album. I was like, "Wow, that was a, a very very powerful album that definitely helped push." through like the last bit of the writing sessions for us like you know that fresh wave of inspiration and like you know a bit of fresh perspective and fresh energy which was really really cool hmm. do you have a favorite album alex um from last year I, i do i do but it's not a metal album 
um, my favourite album. It doesn't matter. No, no, it's um, it's a there's a Swedish funk band called Dirty Loops. Oh yeah, um, yeah. They, they dropped their I think it was their third record last year. Mm-hmm. And honestly, it's so so good. I, I love that sort of music. It's just sort of cheesy disco funk. Um, it's so technical pop. though, as well, isn't it? Yeah, it's like yeah, it's just amazing. Um, and it's it's good to when you're immersed in metal so much. It's good to not listen to metal as well. It's good yeah. to take a step back. Um, so yeah, I'd say that's definitely my favorite from last year. Yeah, cool. Yeah, also to get some inspiration for songwriting, but we'll come to that later, I think. <laughs> <laughs> in heavy rotation in the uh, the band isn't it after the shows is that dirty loop out dirty loops album to be fair they're talking about catalog so um let's talk about your band envisions um the genre is metalcore but very brutal even close to deathcore with harsh and nasty vocals not too many clean vocals sometimes a bit rap and gent so i'd say kind of a brutal version of currents maybe but with vocal range like in landmarks does that fit or how would you describe your sound Kind of com- compare our sound to our influences, really. And our influences are mainly that sort of early generation of metalcore bands, like your Killswitch Engage, um, your Bullet for My Valentine, Trivium, that sort of thing. Um, it, we, obviously, with modern influences as well. Um, I mean, in, in our songwriting, we, we, we have a lot of sort of orchestral elements in there. We, we have a lot of layers, a lot of synth layers, a lot of keys. Um, so you do have that modern element to it as well. Oh yeah, big time! Like Periphery, that P3 album was a massive like uh, influence yeah. for us, wasn't it? It's was a huge kind of like, wow, music can be you know something bigger than just kind of a couple of guys in the room. You know, all the extra elements you can make it feel otherworldly, which is. But yeah, I, I definitely say we we do touch on the deathcore side of things. Things do get pretty uh, pretty spicy, but uh, you know we always come back yes. down to the uh, melodic <laughs> side as well. So your new album Deadlock will be released in February, February 12th. And I just saw on your Instagram that you started recording already 160 weeks ago. So it's about oh, really? time to, yeah, wow. to wow. release it. <laughs> wow, yeah. I get, um, I get like Instagram story kind of things as well because I, I like behind the scenes on like my own personal Instagram as opposed to kind of like the band's because it's just, I feel like it's not giving too much away if it's on mine. But um, yeah, I got one the other day, which was like two years ago. I wrote one of the first riffs that was on this record. And I'm like, wow, you know, that's a long, long time. But I think, you know, with all this stuff going on with COVID, naturally, like the incubation period for the record has been longer than normal because there's been no urgency and no necessary like, deadlines to release, which is, I think, you know, been a bit of a blessing for us because it's given us time to really go back and revisit the record and make sure that we're 100 happy with everything instead of kind of being like forced to try and push things out of the door yeah i mean it, it really doesn't feel like two years at all does it that's that's crazy i, I, I remember uh, sending you the demo for one of the tracks last light which is a uh, track seven on the album and then going around to yours that night to record it and that seems like you know a couple of months ago <laughs> not two years wow <laughs> Yeah, this pandemic goes since forever. <laughs> um, but how would you describe your new record, Deadlock, also compared to your previous album, Between You and Me? Ooh, go on, Al. Better. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it's definitely loads better. Yeah. It's, it's, it's more grown up. It's, it's way more mature. I mean, musically, musically speaking and technically speaking, it's just far more mature. Um, it's a phrase we've banded around a lot that it has a, a bit of a longer shelf life, we feel. that Every every track has something to it that you're going to remember and that you're going to be able to uh, sort of relate to. And it just makes it much more of a special record. Whereas Between You and Me, although we, we loved it at the time, we loved every track at the time, um, there's tracks on there that we don't even consider putting into our live show. Um, and, you know, we want to play every single song from Deadlock every single one we, we love yeah. them. we love them all we're proud of them all I think we like when we kind of went into the writing process of Between You and Me we were really enjoying playing the heavier songs off the first record live so we wrote a really heavy album you know what I mean so it's something that is a, like, a little bit more lasting you know because all the albums that I mean I don't I don't know about you but we, I still go back and listen to probably about the same four or five albums all, yeah. all the time yeah, yeah. I've, I've, I've got a rotation of like early metal call albums that I'll, that I'll still go back to because they mean so much that's it. I think this this is kind of like a, I'd say our 
take on that, you know, trying to make something that's feels a bit more important than just heavy record that after you know the next breakdown comes out, you're gonna be kind of passed on, I guess. Yeah, definitely. You already released the first single Annihilist in October. And I think it's a killer track with really brutal riffs, but also a very catchy chorus. And um, also the title track has just been released. So did you get any feedback so far? Yeah, it's been massively positive, um, which is, you know, it's awesome for us. We originally were going to release the title track first. So it kind of was strange that it ended up being the last track. And I was just due to like the video kind of stuff. We uh, couldn't really nail what we wanted with the video at the right time. So we ended up going with the Nihilus first, but I'm really happy how that turned out because I think that, you know, the title track, it's the first time we've ever had a title track and it's the song's kind of born out of us not really knowing what we wanted to do with the album. It's about being at this point where we don't know where we want to go as a band and all we know is that we want this to continue and we want to be doing this, you know, for a living and all this. And I think by having it as this like third single right before the record, everyone's kind of understood it a bit better because it's led, you know, all points have kind of led to this point. Um, yeah, so generally the feedback has been incredible. You know, and I think, like, the video's already on, like, 50,000 views, which for us is pretty, in, pretty intense. Yeah, well. pretty, yeah. Mm. Um, let's talk about some of the other tracks. So with the 669, the album starts very heavy already. Um, <laughs> if I, you look for a comparison, I would say kind of Ghost Iris. Oh, But, yeah. um I think you've you've played some shows with them, right? Yeah, they just came on tour with us. Um, they came across the UK uh, to do yeah. the shows in December. I think we got mm -hmm. maybe like three or four shows into the tour, and then unfortunately, uh, the vocalist caught COVID. So those oh, guys no. had to leave the tour. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's literally, that worst thing that can possibly happen to bands on tour now. Like, mm. just kills the entire tour, and then all the money invested all the time and the fact that you're stuck in another country is just yeah like props to ghost iris for you know i think they're probably the only band other than our boys and skywalker who we know have done full european and like you know uk tours i think it's incredible that you know they're actually out there going you know like it doesn't matter what the risk level is we're going to do it because like that's how important it is to them. yeah it's, it was it was also awesome. it was it was great watching ghost iris for those few shows that we actually did with them in the uk as well just a, mm. a really interesting watch fantastic fantastic guys technically um mm. and yeah just a, a really great live show so it's yeah. yeah. so that they had to go home early I haven't seen them live already, but I really like their um, the record they released last year, the Comatose album. Yeah, yeah. It's pretty it's very good. good. It sounds yeah. very, very good live, so uh, I would recommend as soon as you shows back, <laughs> put that on your list. Yes, definitely. Um, Half-Life is a bit softer, and uh, Annihilator becomes very poppy in the chorus, as I just said. Mm. Um, so the first tracks already show what we will hear on the album, but there are still surprises with rap and more gen parts and more synths also some riffs that i'd expect to hear in a true metal band so to speak so yeah many different styles um that's why i'm interested how your songwriting works how uh, where do all these influences come from just being obsessed with music for too long <laughs> <laughs> it usually starts with uh, me or alex writing something like and we both have quite different styles uh, alex is the way more traditional you know, like metal, like, you know, like the old school. And I'm kind of like pulling a bit more from the new school. So then like when you kind of mix the two together, I think that's where you get this blend of, it's weird because it, I guess maybe it doesn't feel dated, but there's that element of like nostalgia. You don't like, cannot quite place it, but he kind of calls back to a lot of the, you know, stuff you used to hear. But yeah, I don't know. I'll, you still, you love it, mate. You're straight in with them marching beats. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, like, literally, like, I, I got into metal by listening to thrash bands, and I oh, okay. absolutely love all that stuff still to this day. Hmm. Um, so, and and yeah, like Lucas says, there things like marching beats and stuff, just classically heavy stuff, things that Metallica would, would write. Um, I, I love all that stuff, and I, I love trying to incorporate that into sort of modern day metalcore songs. It's cool, because I think everyone gets a bit like shocked by it because it's uh. Like, oh, what's this new thing when in actuality it's like, you know, the oldest trick in the book. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. It just works <laughs> so well. Mm. Yeah, and you just said at the beginning you also listen to other stuff besides metal, metalcore and all that. So I think oh, yeah, massively. 
You can also hear that on the album. That's fantastic news. Dope and Dealer are written in capitals, so are these songs related somehow? Yeah, absolutely, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, they're um, obviously together, it's Dope Dealer. The song, like, it's kind of about, it's about addiction and, like, you know, dealing with that and helping support someone who's kind of going through that because I think a lot of the time it's always kind of looked at as, like, oh, that person should just, you know, sort themselves out. But there's a lot of the time there's an underlying you know, emotional trauma, which is usually a trigger for that. And I think mm -hmm. it was, it, it wasn't really intended that like dope was written and then dealer was written quite a bit later, but I, I wanted to tell the other side of the story because dope's quite aggressively in a bit, you know, from the outside looking in, it's that kind of opinion of like, you need to sort yourself out and like, you know, I can't understand what you're doing, but then dealers more from the perception of the person actually dealing with the addiction and, you know, saying like, It's like, do you not think I'm trying? And that, I thought, yeah, it was, it's interesting. It's always, it's a conversation. It's a conversation that should be had. And I think a lot of the time, a lot of people don't see both sides of that conversation. It's something I wanted to put across and, you know, make a point of being that there's two sides to the story. And Dealer's quite emotive, particularly at the end. Like, it's got a super epic ending and that kind of, it just really lays it all bare. And it's, it's that cry for help. And I think when you take that into consideration, you kind of look at the way you want to support or deal with addiction a little bit better. You know, it's a bit more rounded topic as opposed to just kind of writing someone completely off because, you know, there's always stuff going on and take a little bit of time to try and understand both sides of the story. But yeah, I'm really glad that you uh, noticed that. That's mint. That's the first time uh, you know, it's been noticed yet. So yeah. Oh, really? news. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, there are really um, strong topics on the album. Also, the title is a very strong word, the title Deadlock. And the other topics, I think, are loss and frustration and also kind of self-doubt. So mm. um, what does the album mean for you personally? In terms of, there was a lot of self-doubt when it came to writing this album. Like, you know, when obviously having live music and everything kind of taken away from you, as musicians, You, f you put your worth and a lot of like your appreciation for your own achievements and stuff into the music. So, you know, if you're not getting you know, the new shows or you're not doing this and you're not doing that, you're not seeing these payoffs, you start to kind of, it, it does eat you and you start to not really know who you are because you've put all of your worth into this other thing. And I think that was the biggest kind of learning curve for us um, over the pandemic. And it's like trying to find your own self-worth when that kind of part of your identity has been taken away. And that's kind of where the idea of deadlock was born because you're stuck. You can't really move forward until you know what you're going to do. But at the same time, you know, for us as musicians, all we want to do is the one thing we're not allowed to do. And that's, you know, it's a really, really hard thing to deal with. There's, yeah, there's definitely a lot of dealing with the self-doubt and trying to, you know, piece yourself back together and overcome that. I think obviously there's uh, the last two tracks on the record do deal with loss in quite a uh, you know a deep and <laughs> quite a dark way. You know it's it's not painting anything to be pretty, and I think it's looking at you know dealing with loss and being in that situation where you know it's you're supporting someone who is kind of going through that process or maybe knows that something's coming and trying to be that support whilst also you know, it's excruciatingly painful. It's not something that you can do likely. It's really, really difficult to do that. And it's, it's, it's quite a, a dark ending on the song, but I think it's really emotive and really raw. And it brings that point home and you kind of, it changes the whole angle of the song. Cause the whole angle of the song is kind of someone speaking to someone who like, has been supportive for someone. And then the last little section is actually the, the person, you know, getting their expression out of how they're feeling and that changes the entire you know perspective of the song but yeah you have to listen in for that one and see if uh, you can pick up on it but it's, uh, mm, yeah, yeah but the especially the last song was very impressive because it started um kind of supportive especially with the lyrics and then i think mm. in the end it says there is no happy end so like you just said it changes the whole yeah. purpose of the song mm. somehow Yeah, massively. I think, um, yeah, it's, it's that thing of like, you know, no matter what you do, you can 
try and put a, a happy face on it. But at the end of the day, you know, it's, it's you know, you can only fake a smile for so long. And I think it's really difficult. It looks at, like you said, both sides of that, and it does kind of twist it on its head. And for me personally, I always find that as soon as I hear that bit, I want to go back and listen to the song again because I want to. Yeah, it's just like you know when you watch a movie and all of a sudden there's a bit of a twist at the end and you go, oh wow, like maybe I need to. There's another layer that you then get from it, which is you know, something we definitely wanted to incorporate with this record. Like they say, we're on about different influences. We listen to a lot of like hip hop and a lot of rap, and I think that's probably one of the biggest changes from us, particularly lyrically. Like the bands that we're listening to lyrically, we used to listen to a lot more like I don't know, not gangster rap I don't, I don't really know what you'd call it but you know now listening to a lot more you know a lot of deeper artists who lyrically you know some of the absolute all-time greats who are very introspective and kind of dealing with things in a different way and telling stories and that was the biggest kind of eye-opener to like me when it came to lyric writing is that like, I wanted to tell a story I wanted it to be you know a journey that you could go on lyrically and not just kind of something that you'd throw away um, Alex, have you been involved in the um, in the lyric writing as well? No. Well, I mean, me and Lucas would go to the studio and we'd do vocal demo sessions um, where Lucas would record all the vocals and then we'd hand that over to Ben to go into the studio and uh, mm. record his takes. Um, so I was there sort of um, saying, yes, this is good. <laughs> or no, this should probably be a bit <laughs> Yeah, we were both getting, like, I suppose, the producing those sessions, to be fair like mm. between us and kind of figuring out where the vocals were. But I think it's, it's the first time we've actually not written vocals together. Like normally it would be me and Al that would write the mm. vocals for the records together. Yeah. But I, I, I mean, in, in terms of, like you say, about the um, about what the record's sort of mainly about, I think you, if, if, if you could look at our group chat during that sort of 18 months, two-year period, I mean, the band group chat, which was all the guys in the band, um, and the frustration of you know being stuck at home and not being able to get out there and do what we love, um, you, you kind of you kind of encapsulated what we were all thinking with your lyrics, basically. Mm. And we all relate to it, and that's how we know that everyone else is going to relate to it as well. So yeah, we're we're on the same page with them. It was yeah, it's a pretty uh, cool moment. I think like university, the album actually brought us like you know up to, we're all like best mates anyway. But university, the album's brought us closer together because it's mm. given us a voice for. Yeah, like the frustrations that we're all kind of feeling and not really, you know, not really probably expressing as we should and not, you know, knowing how to express. And I think like that was the biggest relief. You know, we finished the album, things started to come back and it felt like all of that weight that we'd had has all of a sudden kind of just disappeared. And we've put it in this like, we put it in this record and that's stamped with that moment of time and we can, you know, we can revisit it then, but we don't have to kind of carry that weight, which is pretty cool. Mm. Mm. so it's like um you also grow more together as a band in this phase. oh massively massively yeah i think uh you know we, we're always pushing each other as well to just be you know the best version well of ourselves as people but i guess as musicians like you know it, like, i'll write stuff that i can't play i write stuff that you can't play and we only sit there banging our heads against the wall until we can do it and like that's i think we're hyper competitive which makes it quite fun because you're always <laughs> you know you're always trying to make it out to the other person and you know ultimately we come away from every record being better musicians because of the fact that we've just been there being like i'll bet you won't got to play this one <laughs> well like, uh, i can tell you i didn't know you were intentionally trying to make things uh hard for me to look <laughs> <laughs> nah i was that was a happy accident happy accident <laughs> But with all these topics, I wondered why there was no ballad on the on the record. Oh, yeah. <laughs> there's a, a little interlude, doesn't there, before I follow me. There's a interlude called Inertia, which is probably the closest you'll get to a ballad from us, I reckon. Um, I don't know. I just, I, just don't, I don't think we're there yet. I mean, this record was already a bit of a... I mean, it's still super heavy, but it's super heavy, super riffy. But it was a bit of a move away from like the kind of just the breakdown heavy, I'd say. Um, you know, maybe we'll get to the ballad one day. I know Ben's absolutely chomping at the bit for a ballad, he isn't he? he? Loves it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's he's uh, he's ready. He's there with the acoustic guitar, just like let's go. <laughs> maybe we'll get that. Maybe that's safe for the next record. Got to hold some things back, <laughs> don't we? 
<laughs> I personally don't like acoustic guitars. I don't know why. Maybe because of this <laughs> strange situation that you're getting when someone um, grabs the acoustic guitar, everybody else is quiet and just listening to this person playing the yeah. guitar. And I think that's weird. <laughs> you've clearly been to the yeah. You've clearly been to them parties where that person gets the guitar out and starts playing like Wonderwall, and everyone's like, yeah. oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Quick <Yes>. smile and <laughs> nod. <laughs> mm, yes. <laughs> um, did the pandemic also kind of help you to focus on music? Yeah, oh, massively. Yeah, I'd say so. I don't know, but I, I don't know about you, Al, but I thought it gave it gave me more time, it gave me more time, more focus. Like to be honest, I had like uh, so many friends who were having you know really hard times dealing with the pandemic, and but. I was so absorbed in music that I didn't really notice. Like it's, you know, quite ignorant really, but you know, I had a pretty good time all in all. Well, apart from, you know, the, the fact that I just talked about how mentally draining the, you know, the entire process was, but <laughs> I was so like focused and locked in this kind of like bubble of just working on the record, like any minute that was available. I thought it was quite it was it gave you something to work on, which I think where a lot of people didn't have. So having that kind of you know, still target and goal was super helpful for me. I think I think for me that, that came a bit later. I mean at, at the beginning of the pandemic when we were writing, I was just so frustrated with, with the whole lockdown situation, not being able to do simple things like going to the gym. Um mm. that when I when I'd sit down to write and put a riff down, I'd be so hypercritical and I would delete everything or I'd wake up the next morning listen to it back and say, that's that's awful, start again. But then eventually, as, as the month sort of rolled on, I think I finally sort of could sort of direct that frustration into the music I was writing. And in the end, you know, it actually came out with a positive result. Yeah, I for me, it also helped me to focus on stuff and to get things done that I would have been so slow uh, doing <laughs> if, there, if I wouldn't have had the time to really mm -hmm. focus on it. I see. It's, it's a bit of a reset, wasn't it? Like I sort of think, well, I mean, obviously, I, I was still working like my, my day job and stuff through it as mm. well. But even so, it was the closest thing I've ever probably felt to like you know when you're in school and you have like summer holidays because that's you know the most time that I've ever spent like at home was when yeah. you were a kid and you had some holidays. So you know, having that pure time just at home and not being away doing stuff, it was yeah, you could super focus in. And then as soon as things started coming back and everyone was doing stuff, I felt so overwhelmed with plans. I was like, oh, my God, I don't know whether I'm coming or going. Like, yeah, it was intense. And also, um, me personally, um, music helped me a lot to also get and still go through all this. I'm very happy that bands keep releasing albums. Some bands stopped or released their albums a bit later because they hoped they would be able to go on tour and stuff. Mm. Um, But yeah, um, I spend a lot of time listening to music and I'm really happy that bands like you <laughs> release music these days also. <laughs> oh, thank you. Yeah. I think uh, at first a lot of people were a bit hesitant, but, you know, as it it became quite you know clear that it's not going to dissipate anytime soon, mm -hmm. you know, you've got you've got to do it. You know, we we released a single, didn't we? I think it was like two months. We released a, a single track called Gold Blooded two months into the pandemic. Um <laughs> Yeah, at that point, probably still thinking that things were going to blow over. But um, so we didn't actually get to play that song live until December this year, even though it was released in May oh, yeah. last year. So, like, sorry, subtract a year from that last statement. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, no, I, I think you got to, like, you know, after a certain amount of time, I feel bad for bands like Polaris because they released the record, I think it was either right at the end of December or just at the start of the year. But they've just released the record. I'm pretty sure they did, like, five or six states in Australia for it and they have like world tours planned and they just got pulled and they've not been able to do anything since and it's like for a band that's you know trying to promote a record that is literally just the most devastating thing that could possibly happen mm -hmm. so, and, you know now they've kind of probably sat there with the option of like do we release a new record to tour with or do we try and tour a record that's two years old and like that's you know that's fairly unheard of no one would ever have to go all right we'll tour the release of this record two years down the line because it's the first time seeing it live or not it still feels like an old record yeah yeah, yeah. you recorded your album during the lockdown so how did this recording process work 
Did you record it at home um, at your own studio or did you, were you able to go to a studio? Both. Um, so recorded all the guitars in this very room. Um, yeah, the guys that we have like produced our previous albums, I used to do some work with them. So like I'm aware of their like, processes of recording and we've kind of like learned a lot from them about like the writing and recording stage. So we actually recorded all the music ourselves and did all like produce the records in terms of all of, like, the production elements. Um, and then the only stuff that was actually recorded with them, which was recorded by Sam Gray and Sound Audio, was uh, the vocals. Because Ben just has a great relationship with Sam. And like, there's something different about, you know, doing vocals. I think you have to be in the right place and the right mood and the right mindset because it's so expressive. Like, you know, if you're not capturing that moment, then it's just not going to come off. Like, you know, guitars at the end of the day, you can plug a guitar into a computer in any room and it doesn't yeah, know that's it. Effect. But, you know, that vocal, it has to be right. And Sam and Ben's working relationship, like Sam just knows how to get the best out of Ben. And I think if I tried to record Ben, he'd probably want to punch me in the face because I'd say I'd do it <laughs> take too many times. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I'll leave that to uh, Sam and Ben. And then it was, the album was actually mixed by Joe Graves again. But I think this was the first time we've been like so involved with the mix process because next day we, we spent so long recording and producing the album ourselves. We had a finished version of the album, which was you know wasn't mixed, well, not really like mastered and had like the final tones on and stuff before we'd even gone to the studio. So we we knew what we wanted it to sound like, and it took quite a lot of time to make it, you know, the one. But I think this, we got there in the end. Definitely the best sounding album we've ever produced mm. we're listening to it in the uh in the car with like the cds the other day because they just like came through and it's just like yeah nice little fist bump moment of, like yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um and um where did you learn to do the recordings by yourself um it was just from the guys at the studio they're like the guys that produced our like previous records sam and joe um we've been we've been made with those guys ever since we were like kids so you know um probably like you know pushing 15 years now and as they learn how to do stuff okay mm -hmm. like you know we've always been around them and just kind of pick things up and you know i definitely got a massive interest in you know the recording and producing side of records and stuff so over the like the last over the periods of the albums i've been more and more involved with that side of it to the point where this time round, because there's so many guitar layers and so much guitar stuff going on it made more sense for us to do it correctly in the first place because otherwise we'd just go into the studio trying to recreate something that we captured, you know, the way we wanted it in the first place. Does that make mm. sense? So, you know, you'd finish a song. Um, you said it earlier, like you said, that first track, like that Last Light was one of the first tracks that I think we finished actually recording. You sent it over to me and I think I messaged you like two minutes later, like, so you're going to come to my house now we're going to record this because this is mint. Mm. And uh, yeah, within like maybe like six hours, that was down, which is pretty cool. So I think the workflow just worked really nicely. It didn't really hinder us too much. I think it kind of, wait, well, yeah, opened doors as opposed to closed them. I also watched your videos. You released three videos up until now, I think. Um, and one of them was really impressive. I think it was for Dope, which was mm -hmm. partly filmed underwater. So in kind of fish tanks. <laughs> how how was filming? How did you do that? <laughs> Please tell me us about that. Uh, it was it was it was an interesting day. It was it was shot over two days. So there's two locations in that video. Um, there's one, as you say, which is in that in that massive tank. Um, there's one in there, which is basically a massive warehouse um, in Manchester, mm -hmm. UK. Um, so the, the first day shooting in the tank was was very interesting. There was. Um, <laughs> <laughs> to say the least. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Did anybody catch a cold? <laughs> um, worse than that, I mean, to put it bluntly, our, our singer almost drowned. Oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, yeah, it was... Um, it was but basically, there was... I think there was there was one person holding the tank. One person holding the chute, wasn't there? And then there was yeah, one person like... holding the tarp on top, I think. Um, yeah, there's a big fish tank which was covered over the top and we were trying to get those shots of it filling up and so like we had to cover it didn't we with the tarp and then to put the yeah. hose in it 
but 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 when you were put, when you were holding the hose, you couldn't see how much was actually in the tank, mm. or you you were sort of you were relying on the uh, the directors, um, which is life is art visuals. We were relying on them to tell us, um, you know, when, when to cut when to cut the water, um, and obviously there's a lot of sound going on and it's very noisy. You can't hear anything, and it's. I think it was uh, quite quite distressing <laughs> for Ben to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And not to mention like the uh, the water that was in the tank. So there was two separate tanks. There was one which was like a storage tank and the one that we were using because we were having to pump mm-hmm. water from one tank to the other. The one that we were using was originally heated. So like the water was heated when we got there. We did like the drum shots and then the guitar shots. So Ben was the last one to go in because we obviously need to take the water up and down. Um, but yeah, so it was heat when we got there. This was like January of last year so you know we've been sat on this like say we've been sat on this video for a while we were shooting the videos whilst we were doing they still finishing the album but this was shot in january it was snowing outside it was like minus three degrees it's a warehouse so like the only thing that was warm in the building was actually the water to start with and um by the time we started moving it in and out to put ben in and these like you know these titanic scenes <laughs> um, it, because it was being moved out the tank it was moved to the other tank which wasn't heated so when you were pumping it back in the water was so so cold like mm. you know props to Ben I can imagine yeah yeah he, I mean he was he was suffering you know like, almost drowned so there were hypothermia like you know he yeah, really yeah. really mm. gave everything didn't he on that shoot he came, he came out shivering and looking miserable didn't they even there uh, you can't blame him <laughs> yeah no i was um i think uh yeah immediately wrapped him as many towels as you can humanly find and uh put him in the car and <laughs> put the heating on but yeah it was um it was pretty brutal but it was i mean it looks incredible i think it really like surpassed anything that we kind of thought and like we had so quite a few people be like oh yeah it's, uh, like the cgi on this is mint it's not CGI, mate. Like, <laughs> like we almost drowned him. It was, uh, it was like weird as well. Like, you, you didn't realize that when we got into the tank, uh, you know, obviously people float, and this tank's full of chlorine as well, so you actually float quite a lot. So we were like wearing weighted vests underneath our clothes as well, and uh, you know, trying to play drums and guitars underwater, which guitars also float in water, by the way, which is really difficult to try and hold a guitar underwater and pretend to play. Yeah. Whilst like I was just trying to like fly up to the ceiling, um, yeah, it was a, definitely a massive learning curve, but um, it's one off the bucket list, isn't it? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, it looks impressive. So um, we will link the video in the show notes. So if you're listening to this podcast right now, you can just go to the show notes and click on the link and watch it after you finished listening to this episode. Deadlock already is your third album and your band was f- just founded in 2016. So that's <laughs> a lot of albums in a very short time. Where do you yeah. get all your inspiration from? <laughs> Not songwriting wise, but for topics and everything. <laughs> oh, I don't know. Um, it's hard, isn't it? Like, I mean, it is pretty mental when you think about it. So what we're coming up to like being a band six years, I think we'll burn this album that comes out. We'll release something like 48 songs which is, you know, more songs than some people release in entire careers, which is mad. Mm. Um, but I, I don't know, it's, it's all situational. I think that was the issue we had with this album, I think, a bit because, you know, we didn't really know where we wanted it to go. And sometimes you just kind of got to stop overthinking it and just let it all roll off the tongue. Writing music and stuff isn't something that we go, we do, you know, it's like, oh, okay, we need to write an album for this purpose. It's something we do for fun, like, you know, like the idea of fun for us is sitting in front of a computer for hours, getting lost in trying to perfect a riff or trying to, you know, tweak this little drum sound to make it sound strange. Like, so it's just a passion of love, isn't it? Or whatever. I can't remember what the expression is, but um, <laughs> yeah, just uh, being, being obsessed with music is probably where it comes from and um, having to try and find just a way to express yourself, I guess. We were actually talking about this today, um, earlier on, weren't we, about which albums we preferred from our back mm. catalogue. Um, and I think you, you, we kind of, I don't think we ever agreed in the end, did we? I, I, I thought no. that our first album, Never Nothing, was uh, was better than our second, just in terms of sort of the musical direction it took. It was more sort of, as, as we were mentioning earlier, sort of more sort of 
influenced by classic metal rather than you know your, your new school metalcore sort of stuff. Although it was essentially a metalcore record, whereas the second album was very just sort of balls to the wall heavy. Um, but 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 it's interesting though because that that first record we we had you know about two years to write that if not longer. I mean some of the songs on there were were demos that you'd written yeah. years and years before, like for previous bands and stuff. So I mean we had all the time in the world to write that, and that sort of that sort of echoes the process with Deadlock as well, having about two years to write to write this. Um, it felt like a so fresh start, can, didn't it? Yeah, like, yeah. I think you can, you can draw parallels between the two. Yeah, definitely. I think that. That kind of um, the idea, you know, you have your entire life to write your first album, and then afterwards, it's like you better chew the next one out in a year. <laughs> um, you know, like we released the first album. I think after three months after that, we released a single, and then we released another album with just over a year. Um, whereas this time round, like by, by having that extended period of time, it felt like we were getting the opportunity to really. Kind of start again and decide what we wanted to do and make sure that when we kind of came out the gate it was going to be exactly what we wanted so yeah it's definitely nice to have that kind of fresh start opportunity i think that's where it comes from just time time away from your desk and time at your desk (laughs) (laughs) i can totally recommend listening to the album because it's really good quality and sound songwriting and also the skills on your instruments and whoever likes the more metal, quote-unquote, metalcore, should definitely listen to it. That have been my questions about your album. Is there anything else you want to add? I'd say make sure you pick up Deadlock on uh, February 11th. It's uh, probably, well, definitely our best work we've ever done. Super proud of the album. I think there's some, something for someone, something for everyone on there. Yeah, And, and also let us know on social media what, how, how you feel about it. But don't hurt yeah. our feelings. But, 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 but don't hurt our feelings. Love it. <laughs> yeah. Where can people find you on social media? Oh, everywhere. If you um, envisions official on Facebook, envisions underscore official on Instagram. We're also on Twitter, envisions tweets. We've actually just made a TikTok account only a couple of days ago as well because got to stay uh, got to stay down with the kids haven't we um so yeah i think we're going to be uh experimenting on tiktok a little bit as well trying to give some like behind the scenes stuff and some like rig rundowns and all sorts of like cool things obviously yeah follow us on youtube as well youtube's where you get all the best stuff first though mm. if you ever want any merch or anything like that uh, envisionsofficial.com we've got all sorts of vinyls t-shirts hoodies you pick up from there we ship all over the world so we'll personally I can ship your order, so letting you know it's in there if you want to signing. I think there are more and more bands coming to TikTok now. When I downloaded the app, I don't know, th- six months ago, there haven't been a lot, so I deleted it. But now I hear from a lot of bands that they try it again with TikTok. <laughs> oh, yeah. it's. Uh, I mean, literally, I think we've posted about two things on there. But it's where people's attention is right now. Like, naturally, the reach on it is just loads better. I think I posted a video which broke down the uh, chorus from my latest single, Deadlock. So you can look at all the different tracks and how we kind of created that. And, you know, that's all already done, like, you know, really well for us and got a lot more kind of, like, natural reach than you would on something like Facebook. Just a bit more of a fun platform, I think. I think if you can give something to people on there and, you know, entertain them, but also inform, I think people really enjoy it. I know, like, I've definitely lost a few hours on there. (laughs) Yeah. And I think Facebook is a bit worn out no oh yeah yeah facebook's doom and gloom isn't it you're lucky if you can put out a post that's not um miserable where they're fighting the uh <laughs> the batches of negativity to try and promote a record <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um i have a more general question so um how's the metalcore scene in the uk like and can you recommend any bands maybe some bands that are not so famous already so many the uk metalcore scene is so good Mm. I'd, I'd, I'd say that the first one that sort of springs to mind is is um, is basically our hometown friends in Caskets um, who mm-hmm. signed yeah. to uh, who signed to Sharp Tone last year or the year before. Who've just released yeah. their debut album. And they're they're doing really well for themselves at the moment. Um, but that album is absolutely phenomenal. Well yeah, worth a listen. Pretty remarkable, isn't it? A debut mm. album. It's uh, mm-hmm. yeah, it's uh, it's definitely one for the history books. Mm. But you know, there's also uh, City's Hours, um, oh, yeah. really good friends of ours. You know, they I think they've released their second record only a couple of months ago. Yeah, the, the, honestly, I saw such, them on YouTube. Yeah, 
Yeah, there's, oh, there's, oh, there's yeah, signed to a rising empire, aren't they? So uh, mm. I think they'll have been getting a bit more European love on this record, which is cool. But they were meant to be doing their first European tour with Our Hollow Our Home, but I think that got pushed back. Also, shout those guys out, Our Hollow Our Home. We've, uh, we've toured with them quite a few times now, and they are fantastic guys. Yeah, they've helped us out massively, I think. You know, they took yeah. us to Europe for the first time. You know, they took us to Europe for the first time, took us on, like, you know, a tour in the UK when, you know, we weren't necessarily even getting tours in the UK. So, you know, we've got a great relationship with those guys. They always look after us and always super excited. I think it's just nice to, yeah, have ears in bands who are, like, is as excited about your music as you are. So, yeah. you know, we can always get, like, really gassed on each other's music, which is mint. <laughs> Another band that had to cancel the show from the UK is As Everything Unfolds. They released their debut oh, yeah. album last year. They're also really good, I think. Yeah, they've just blown up, haven't they? Um, I've actually been listening to a lot of their stuff. I think they've just got confirmed. I think it's for Resurrection Festival in Spain as well. So that's going to be mega. They're, gonna, they're making some moves. Like, their, their album is bang on. It's so, so good. I think they actually mm. used the same water tank that we used uh, for one of their videos as well. Ah, uh, yeah. For yeah. Grayscale, I think, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, no, they're smashing it. Just to be fair, honestly, at the moment, in the UK scene, obviously because of the UK is being one of the few places to have shows as well. I feel like the UK scene is getting so much love and everyone who's in the UK scene because not as many bands are coming. People who are, you know, music fans in the UK are giving more UK bands love. You know what I mean? They're, they're paying more attention to the bands I've actually got in their own country, which is, which is mm. super cool, you know, because a lot of the time I think some bands, you know, maybe wouldn't get as much attention, but it's really putting the focus on UK bands, which is nice because... Love a good uh, metal scene. A thriving metal scene is a good metal scene. Okay, thank you so much um, for for your time, <laughs> for the interview. No worries. Thank you for having us. Thanks. Yeah, thank you for having us. We have a traditional question in the end that we ask, <laughs> that we always ask. So, um, what's your favorite song at the moment? <sighs> Ooh, yeah. Right, actually, this is might be controversial. So, I would normally, I would say. That Half Life is probably my favorite song in the moment because it's just like it's one of those little, it's my little lamb. You know, it took a while to make that one happen, but it, it all panned out and it's just great. And like we're playing that one and it's really kind of really get, it's getting really exciting when we're playing it in the practice room and stuff. But I'm going to say it right now, I'm going to say Deadlock because that song to me is the first time we've actually ever felt like we're going to put a title track on the record. Yeah, you know, it means it means a lot to me. And You know, seeing how everyone is reacting to that song is kind of just, it's like re sparking that, you know, love that song. So, yeah, deadlock for me. I'm going to go with Fall with Me, the last track on the album. I, I remember the writing process for that one. Um, and I remember just th feeling like I wanted to write a really sort of emotionally explosive song. Um, and then sent that to Lucas. Lucas recorded it. Lucas wrote these amazing lyrics over it. And it was just. You know, just sort of a marriage made in heaven. It's just it. It's absolutely brilliant. Um, it's everything that I wanted the song to be whilst I was writing it. My favorite on your record at the moment is Hint Side. I think that's the oh, one with yeah. the more metalish guitarist. Um, yeah. yeah, it's yeah. got that um, that marching beat and the uh, mm -hmm. second second verse. Yeah, yeah, it's a yeah, it's a banger that in it. Mm. I don't, I don't want to like, I don't want to sound like I'm, you know kissing my own ass but that album is, <laughs> there's so many there's so many bangers on it it's absolute mm. banger city central can't wait for people to hear it and is there a song by a different artist that you are listening to a lot these days the bad, bad omen song the death of the peace of mind i think it's the death of the peace of mind or death of peace of mind um yes yeah, just super cool and i like i listened to it initially and i was like oh that's cool but i've just been going back to it it's been really stuck in my head um so yeah big tune big tune i'm uh, i'm still listening to the album that spirit box dropped last year um some of the singles from that album like um what's it called? circle with me which mm -hmm. is phenomenal songwriting i mean it's really it's really obvious and it's basically essentially just a pop song but it's so well done and the riffs are amazing um so I'd, yeah I'd, i'd probably go with that one yeah great newcomer as well Mm. Yeah, phenomenal album. I listened a lot to Pump It by Eskimo Callboy lately. Um, I don't know, is the band also famous in the UK? 
Oh, Eskimo Callboy. I think they're one of like the absolute titans of the whole COVID like, you know, situation. They have come out of COVID kicking ass. Like everything they have released is so, so good. They're just such a fun band. Like I think it's like I love like you know, you watch the videos and like yeah, I wanna go see them, but I also just wanna have a beer with them. They just seem like great dudes. Um yeah, hyper hyper, pump it, um yeah. I'm, I'm well into that. <laughs> also, a shout out to that latest uh, Wage War album, which is yeah. basically just back to back bangers. What a great <laughs> album! <laughs> yeah, this is just that calling their album banger, banger, yeah, banger collection much. three. <laughs> they consider greatest hits, just greatest bangers four. <laughs> so that's it. That's the episode. Thank you so much for being our guests, and thank you out there for listening to this podcast. Uh, you can find us on Instagram to keep to stay updated about what we do at Pommes Gabel Podcast. And yeah, thank you for listening and bye bye. Thank you for having thank us. You. Bye. Thanks.